you know, bringing forward that kind of traditional thinking and knowledge as an intervention, a cultural intervention. And they would provide uh, whatever was needed so that person could be healed and could return back to their family. And so now we're using that concept um, um, where we are, uh, where we are located in Kona, um, and providing a space so people relate to our land. It's it's um, it's sacred lands where we're at, and um, it's legacy land. So it comes with a history and tradition passed down and given to us today through our queen. But we do have a place, a safe place where they come and they rest. They get to. Um, experience the water and um, do protocol if they choose, so it's very enriching for, for our families. Mm -hmm. And I think that's connected too because in our cosmology, and our way of understanding the world, uh, humans are not at the center of the universe. We are one of a number um, of living beings, of power beings, um, and we have relationships to other, um, other animals and uh, spirit. Um, waterways that we talk about, and so how we understand ourselves as um, consumers uh, versus stewards, I think it really plays into a lot of what we're learning in the policy realm um, around this notion of scarcity. That in uh, a Western frame, often uh, humans as the center really are about um, a power for our own benefit. Um, but in a lot of Native context, those <coughs> who were the most wealthy were not the most who were not the ones who kept for themselves, but they were the ones who gave the most away to the um, most vulnerable and the most needy, which often uh, are our children needing to care for them in particular ways. So I think what we're trying to figure out um, from NCAI and in our research world, how do we develop um, work and uh, initiatives around health, education, that live up to that? And a lot of that is looking at roles, which I'm hearing here. Um, how do we think about uh, the roles that we have in Northwest Alaska that we can leverage and share down to Southwest Alaska? Mm -hmm. So we're developing a lot of what you might call uh, native to native comparisons. And in talking with the chairwoman this morning, Chairwoman uh, Diver, I was really struck um, by hearing about your constitutional process and the fact that you have these five other bands that you're in relationship with. How do you leverage what's happening and really working well here and share that with some of these other groups that you have kind of a political relationship and I would guess cultural linguistic, perhaps some differences, but how do we leverage some of that and work from strength like Michelle was talking about rather than always trying to figure out how to fill the gap? But some of the work I've done with was like with fourth and fifth graders, uh, with younger people, uh, you know, the 10, 11, and 12 year olds um, trying to get their their take on health and health issues uh, and where they are so I've worked with communities where there's there's been researchers in uh, for, for many years uh, and they're getting information from the clinic and from um, from the school and so all these adults basically uh, and so there's never been uh, uh, in, in this particular community I worked with there, there was never any uh, uh, youth voice and so I came in and, and, and using some uh, alternative, what I consider alternative methodologies, um, or, or non-traditional methodologies in, in academia, and I would say they're, they're more congruent with traditional uh, um, Indian methodologies uh, of, uh, of research and dissemination of information, uh, storytelling, and, uh, and being able to uh, um, use imagery to tell those stories. Uh, so I, I gave kids cameras. They uh, uh, they photographed for two weeks what was healthy and not healthy in their communities. Um, they also had G GPS units so we could see how they moved around in the communities, mm -hmm. uh, how far away food sources were, where they were getting their uh, bulk of their food from. Uh, so there's information that comes out of that that um, that the the community could use. The 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 um, elders board, which oversaw the curriculum at the school, was a tribal school. Um, realized that there's some uh, deficits that they hadn't uh, accounted for um, uh, pertaining to language and to traditional foods and things like that because the kids the kids didn't know what a, 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 um, a healthy meal looked like they knew what an unhealthy meal would look like they, they knew the, the flaming hot cheetos were were bad uh, and they had you know 200 pictures of flaming hot cheetos out of 2000 you know so um, 
So with, the, with trying to use different methodologies that are more accessible to the communities uh, and, and mean, more meaningful to the community. So within our mission schooling, we have our own philosophy of education, and one of them says that we will provide education that will enable our children to walk in two worlds, to survive and to thrive in two worlds. But the assumption is not that that is a Māori world, an indigenous world, and a white world. That can be any world. That could be that they can thrive in a Māori world, and a wine world, or a Māori world, and a Choctaw world. So we don't assume that, that those worlds are only about a colonial world. They're actually about a global world. And the, the idea is that our children and our young people will grow and flourish very fully in their own identity, as Derek was saying, wearing their own Māori feet in whatever <laughs> shoes they like, as long as their feet stay Māori, uh, and that they can walk in any world mm and a very firm identity of who they are. They know who they are, they know where they're from, and they don't have to adapt mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. to be a part of those worlds. So I, I think part of that is looking at our relationships with those medications. Mm -hmm. And um, as we look at prescription drugs in particular, there's this idea that they're very safe. They're being prescribed by healthcare providers. Um, it's not necessarily misusing. And um, pain comes in many different forms. It's a psychological process as well as a physical process, which is also piques my interest in pain and how we deal with that culturally and how it's expressed. Because um, there is definitely legitimate pain that occurs within the clinics too. We also have the flip side so people are being treated. Mm -hmm. um, but then also look at how are we going to treat them and in what setting. Uh, plays a big role in who has medications and who doesn't. And then in a cultural setting, if you have a medication, and people have told me, and my brother or sister is in pain, and I was told this medication is safe and able to take it, of course I'm going to hand that off to my relative. Um, and then who's susceptible to those medications um, varies within families even, but those who are susceptible, and then they're highly susceptible, and they're very addictive. And so it's very easy I think for a lot of people to go from this opiate misuse and then on to heroin, on to looking for other drugs that may assist synthetic drug use. Um, I, I, I don't know because we haven't done the research on it, but my hunch would be that it's also seen as safe. Um, they're selling it at a store. It's not really doing drugs, so I'm okay. And uh, unfortunately, it's had some horrible mm -hmm. consequences within our community in particular here in Duluth. 